This is Inside the Tour in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. I'm Alistair Eakin, Lions fanatic and rugby commentator. I plan to stay connected to this summer's tour with the official Lions app, powered by Vodafone. We're on to episode two, which does include some swearing, just so you're warned. And as we get on with the pod, we welcome one of the most familiar voices in rugby, right at the heart of the 1997 story. Everywhere we went, it was backs against the wall. Everywhere. Everywhere. I'm Matt Dawson, and I played scrum half on the Lions Tour in 1997. I was a young pup, sort of following the crowd and a little bit sort of wide-eyed and, yeah, dizzy about the whole thing. But um, looking back, it was turning into, like, the greatest rugby trip of all time. We had to sort of hypnotise ourselves into thinking that we were capable of beating the world champions. Inside the Tour, the full story of the British and Irish Lions in South Africa. The inside story told by those who were there. Yes, Dorse is joining the cast for this second episode of the series. It's the bonding episode, and we're based at the Oatlands Hotel in Weybridge. This is the week to set the tone and set the standards, the week before the challenge of a lifetime in South Africa. We've got assault courses, flip chart brainstorms, and yes, we're off to the pub. Yeah, our lock-in. No one leaves till this place is empty. I thought this is... Yeah, I mean, it was... Basically, we just tried to create as much havoc as possible. And that sort of set the tone. So how does this disparate group of characters, chancers, bolters, legends and lions turn itself into a world-beating band of brothers? We're about to find out. Hello, I'm Dodie Weir, the big log forward from Scotland. The lions, you got to bring the Scots, the English, the Irish and Welsh all together and different players see in different ways. So I think the touring party got the recipe spot on. Enjoy the players, they have a good time, although they're very respectful of why we're there and what the, the goal was and intention. It was important to get the whole squad together, being friends, kind of fighting for each other. Maybe, I don't know, but certainly what came back from 93 in New Zealand was that there were too many cliques and everyone had a great time, but big division between the midweek side and the weekend side. And they sort of wound the clock back more to 89 to say, how can we find that environment? So from day one, we were told that it was a very important part of the trip. I'm Scott Gibbs. So the Lions is, 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 a, is a wonderful experience and a blend of personalities and quirks and idiosyncrasies that really make, create the fabric of, of, a, of a rugby touring side. Yeah, it was professional, but still had that very much the aroma of amateur. Yeah, we, we had team building specialists come in. We weren't allowed to share the room with someone from your own country. You had to sit next to someone that you didn't know on the bus. You know, all the basics that I still see day in, day out when I go to work, that, you know, when you're in new teams and new environments, you need to be able to do to get to understand one another. We were supercharged in that, and I think that helped us enormously. This is Austin Healy. I think everybody mixed almost instantly. The first two nights were basically drinking, and then there was a bit of teamwork, and by which stage you didn't really need to work out how to go and pick up a bottle of a jug of water with a plank of wood because you'd already mixed over a few beers. There was a fair amount of of aloofness and and feeling our way and trying to work out the strengths and weaknesses and the characters uh, in the other teams in in the first week. Rob Wainwright here. There was almost a fifth country one has to take into account, which was Northampton. Uh, There was a strong Northampton contingent, players that maybe would have been 
quite possibly not on the tour if it wasn't for Ian McGeeken, who was obviously coach of the tour. Because I think Northampton possibly had more players than Ireland and Scotland did on, on the tour. It's vitally important that there is a contingent of players, not necessarily from the same club, but the types of players that the coach understands and believes will be a certain type of player to play a certain type of game. And because of the way that we were playing at Northampton, loose, it was fast, it was furious, confrontational, but still very skillful. We were super, super fit. And Geach believed that was going to be the way that the Lions were going to beat South Africa. They were a, a great bunch. But, you know, the whole thing was handled so well. Uh, with Fran Cotton's sort of great legacy for the tour was, was saying no rugby for the first week, it's all team building for the first week. And it, it was a huge success. One thing you've got to recognise uh, in those days was that a lot of the players you didn't know, they, they didn't know one another, they only played against one another in internationals. You know, European club competitions didn't exist. So uh, we focused on the fact that before we go, we've got to try and create as much of a team as we possibly can before we get on the plane. Hello, this is John Bentley. We're on the 1997 British United Lions tour of South Africa. One of the huge, huge influences about how that tour was successful was what McGeeken, Telfer and Cotton invited us to do. Probably the most important thing we did and probably the most sensible thing any manager could have done was to actually ask the players how they wanted to conduct themselves on the tour. How do you want to run the tour? What do you want to be remembered by? So we were all separated into various groups. Bentos was obviously leading one group. Rather than give us a code of conduct, rather than tell us what the code of conduct was, they invited us to decide our own code of conduct and how we wanted to be viewed as a group of British and Irish Lions. And it was to have clarity about what we should do, what we should do with each other and how we deal with the disappointments of tours and injuries and selections and so on to mitigate any ego that we were all very neutral in, in, in one focus and one goal, and that was obviously to, to bring home the Test Series. And we worked in small working groups and we presented to the whole tour party. And then they put together a little flashcard, a couple of little flashcards that we kept that was a reminder throughout the trip. And that's where we ended up with the Lions Laws, which were written down on a little card. I mean, good coaches do this all the time. They let you set the rules in the full knowledge that really they set them. But if the players think that they've set them, then they'll abide by them because there's no argument then. So we, we had that scenario where Geach would suggest, well, what do you think? No drinking the night before a game or two nights? What do you think's appropriate, guys? Or we think 48 hours is appropriate. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Thanks, Geach. <laughs> so it was that sort of scenario where we'd set all the team ship rules and they were fair. They weren't ridiculous. You know, if you were playing in the midweek team, uh, you'd make sure you trained and helped the test team as much as possible. But then at the night, in the night, you could go out Thursday, Friday. If you weren't in the uh, 22 or if you weren't in the standbys, you could go out the night before if you wanted to. But you weren't to wake anyone up in the, in the test team. So the, you had to have respect there. Uh, and I think everyone abided by that. I, you know, there was guys enjoyed the tour. There's no doubt about that. It was a fun tour to go on. Uh, but it wasn't draconian. And I think the level of respect that came from Fran Cotton and Geach and the other coaches, Jim Telfer, down to the team was paramount in the buy-in from everyone. Inside the Tour. The full story of the 97 Lions in South Africa. It's a huge challenge. I think it's one of the greatest rugby challenges to go into the backyard of South Africa and, and to compete right across the, the, the Republic. The intensity not only lies on the field, but also lies in, in the crowd and the, the vociferous nature and the actual rugby passion that they, they lead. So we knew that we're up against the world champions and, you know, some of the greatest names to ever play the game were the opposition. Scott Gibbs was the very first lion that I met on the trip because I was rooming with him. Uh, and I picked up all my kit. I knocked on this big 
enormous, probably like eight foot door, white paneled door with a brass knob. And I've knocked on the door and the door opened. Well, when I opened the door, there he was, my roommate, Matt Dawson, England number nine. And I'm like, oh, hello. It was Scott Gibbs wearing nothing other than a, a really skimpy little towel that he had wrapped around his waist. And I've got... I'm loaded with two kit bags and a suit carrier. Might have looked a bit funny, cos I had a towel around my waist. I'd just come out of the shower perspiring, and we had a ten-minute call to be suited and booted for, uh, I believe, Team Photo. So Matt's in a rush. I've said, hi, Scott. You know, Matt, Matt Dawson, nice to meet you. And he said, hi, Matt, would you like me to iron your shirt? And that was the very first sentence <laughs> that, that a non-English lion said to me on, in that tour of 1997. And then proceeded to iron his pants and shirt, so we were both looking well sharp as we left the room. Would you like me to iron your shirt? And he taught me, I know this sounds ridiculous now, but... He didn't actually... He said, do you want me to iron your shirt? But he didn't have an iron, but he taught me the trick. Let me give you a lesson in domesticity now. Hang his shirt up in the shower, get all the creases out, just a bit of a hack there. Putting the shirt on a hanger and putting it in the bathroom and turning the shower on really hot and steaming the shirt. But I must say, great, great teammate, great tourist. So it was a very educational trip all round. The, what do I remember that, that trip when we thought we were going for another training session and Frank Cotton took us to the pub? The last day over here in Weybridge before we flew out, we trained hard all week and said, right, OK, boys, down tools, we're going to the pub. Well, I think, you know, we talk about other personalities. One of the strongest personalities on the tour was the tour manager, Frank Cotton, and then certainly he, he stepped in my corner on few occasions during the ensuing months. We went in the local pub, a lot of locals there. It says no one leaves till this place is empty. It was, right, go and enjoy yourself, boys. This is just as important as getting flogged on the training park. And normally you see a lot of rugby teams where they all sit in the corner talking to themselves. Go out and get to know one another, air your views. But these guys didn't. They were out talking to the locals, having a beer. Make friends, reacquaint. And that sort of set the tone create some stories that are going to bond you for the next nine weeks of your life. That preparatory period with a knees up at a local pub was just a perfect blend to keep everybody relaxed. We even phoned the director of uh, Young's Brewery and they sent down the head brewmaster to make sure the beer was in absolutely tip-top condition by the time we arrived. So we even got the preparation for the drink right. Yeah, we, did, we didn't rush home. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That happened in 2001 where, you know, we, we all tried to go through this formula, right, let's go to the pub, let's get pissed. And in 2001, we did that, got to the pub, and then whilst we were sat down having a few beers, it was announced when training was going to go on in the morning, so everyone was like, oh, well, I'm not going to make a dick of myself, so I'll stop, whereas... In 97, it was, you know, Philly Boots. The, then the next day, there's a family barbecue. To me, that's what summed up the 97 Lions. Knew when to work and knew when to play. Basically, we just tried to create as much havoc as possible, not only in the pub, but... I'm not sure whether it was the same night where there was a... Was there a wedding in the hotel that night as well? Or So we came back and we're trying to, you know, gate-crash the wedding... I mean, we didn't really need to try too hard because they, you know, they didn't mind a load of rugby lads coming, lions just joining in. Um, yeah, it was. It, I mean, that, that that's just never ever going to happen again. The golden rule, the golden rule about having a drink is the manner in which you train the following day. You train the following day. That we had a problem with one of the players who had a bit too much to drink and and, and ended up in a swimming pool when everybody was in bed. I only ever had to uh, roll at one player in the entire trip, but he was caught skinny dipping in the pool in Durban. And he came to me the following morning, and it was all a chat, and, and he came to me and asked for my advice, what should I do? And I said, well, go, I'd, I'd go speak to Fran first, go and apologise and assure him it won't happen again.
I let it be known I wanted to see the player uh, early in the morning, but I didn't actually see him till uh, after the evening meal. So yeah, he was sweating the whole uh, the whole day, wondering what I was going to say to him. But that was the only time I had to crack the whip with one player. You know, life's about making memories and friendships, and I still look back at '97 as the greatest tour ever. He was a very tall English centre, by the way, who uh, jumped in the pool with no clothes at one in the morning, so... <laughs> yeah. The alcohol one was addressed in a way that we decided there wasn't going to be a uh, a ruling on alcohol. Um, you basically would, if you wanted to have a drink, you could have a drink, but you would be mindful that upon return to the hotel, or even if you were in the hotel, there would be somebody in a room close by who was also was preparing for the probably the biggest game of their lives in perhaps a day or two days' time. I roomed with Paul Wallace for a week in Port Elizabeth. You would think sleep, rest, feed, nutrition, recuperation would be everything. A week in Port Elizabeth, he didn't get into bed. He lay on it. He'd come in at six thirty in the morning, lie on his bed on top of the bed. Half an hour, I'd wake him up. Train, come back, lie on his bed, half an hour, put his gear on, smell his on, out he goes, go again. Cut, copy, piece, repeat, turn up, smash the box. If you're on the Saturday team, you drank until Thursday. If you're on the Wednesday team, you drank until Monday. If you're on the bench, you didn't have a Scooby what to do. You know, it was just such an amazing environment to bond with people and... Yeah, no truer word said from Geech around the whole, you know, 20, 30, 40 years' time, you're going to look at these people in the room and have something, have a connection with this that's going to last you forever. And he was absolutely right. But those connections, the strength of those connections came from just as much off the field as they were on the field. And the story continues after this message from Vodafone's Lions ambassador. Hi, it's Sam Warburton here, captain on the last two Lions tours. Ahead of this year's trip to South Africa, look out for Lions Live, created by Vodafone, bringing you closer to the Lions. We'll have pre-match analysis and discussion, plus exclusive Vodafone Lions content and guests from inside the camp. For more information, make sure you download the official British and Irish Lions app, powered by Vodafone. Hope you can join us for Lions Live. This is Inside the Tour with the Lions of 97. And as we trace this remarkable story, there are two really important gentlemen we need to meet. It was the highlight, still the highlight of my coaching career. Ian was the boss and I was the assistant, and that's the way it was. So Ian McGeechan and Jim Telfer, you'll have heard of them. For most in rugby and for many in sport and business, they set a man management gold standard. Geech and Jim this story would be nothing without them. They were different, but they complemented each other perfectly. They were opposite ends. It was good cop, bad cop. Geech was very calm and softly spoken. Jim was very good at actually transferring that onto the pitch. I don't know if Jim Telfer likes me or not. I would say probably not. I wouldn't be his type of player. I'd say Rob Wainwright would be his type of player. Their command of the English language, but the way they can command a room when they speak, there's no doubt that they were holding the attention of the squad and in charge. Immediately went for uh, Geats as the uh, the head coach. Had a word with Geats and he uh, recommended Jim. It became something which I think, even when you look back on, there was so much we got right just naturally, I think, Jim the direction and what we wanted to do and where we wanted to go so naturally came together. I don't know if you found that, Jim. Yeah, well, with this group of Lions in 97, everything seemed to go so well in the preparation. I mean, you spent a year before uh, you went to South Africa to work with the All Blacks playing against the Springboks. And so... After the 1997 Lions, I took a great interest in rugby again. I thought that my faith in, in, in the Lions uh, was overwhelming after that. And I think that since then, 
the Lions, although they haven't won every series, there's a new meaning to Lions tours compared to what it was before. It certainly was the highlight of my coaching career, and it changed me completely. I mean, uh, the rugby we played, the Lions played, was outstanding. And a lot of that was, as, as I think you said, was due to the preparation and the philosophy that you had about how you wanted to beat the, the Springboks. And it was because of the faith in the way you wanted to play the game. Maybe the Lions benefited as much as anybody from the game going professional. Because <laughs> yeah. you say, I was able to go out the year before. The All Blacks were really good, realising what we probably had to do as a, a group and what I think what we had to look for. And then we actually looked for the type of player that we thought could produce that game. We couldn't select by committee. 93 was a disaster because there was a committee of about nine and we tried to really get the players we wanted to have and, and the ones we thought could best really challenge what South Africa were as a rugby country. Yeah, nowadays I think the, the, the coaches are, and the, for the Lions are a great array of talent to pick from. But even in 97, I mean, to be able to choose players who would fit into the way you wanted to play the game, I think was, uh, you know, the first time that uh, I had been in that sort of advantageous position for a kid. It was a luxury, you know. The ultimate choice comes out the coach and his coaching team. The great thing about 97 was that the pieces were there. You know, you might be at one end of the field with the forwards and I'd be at the other end with the backs. But I knew exactly all the messages were the same. All, all right, they, they delivered slightly differently or the certain different things that have to be done by players. But ultimately, what we were looking at, the game we wanted to play, we both had the same game in our heads. When you start a tour, everybody, the sole purpose in life is to go on tour to be successful. And everybody has that aim and ambition. So the first week uh, in London were very useful. One, for you getting your philosophy across and how we wanted to play the game. Teams within teams was one yes. of your favourite things you said. Uh, yeah. And teams within teams. And that's absolutely true. It's still true now. The players got to know each other. They liked each other. And one of the great things I found about the players... Before we left London to go to South Africa, to go to Dublin for another week's preparation, they were the salesmen. And I think that that was one of the telling points about the tour was that they, were, they wanted to play the way that you asked them to play. They became the salesmen for, for the brand of rugby that you wanted to play. The remarkable Ian McGeechan and Jim Telfer, who have an episode all to themselves coming later in this series. So they're in place, alongside tour manager Fran Cotton. Now all they needed was a captain. Inside the tour. I met Peter Wheel at the rugby writers' dinner in, uh, I think it was December or early January, and he said, uh, you ought to look at Martin Johnson. He said, uh, whoever was captain less at the time had been injured and Martin had uh, taken over from him. Uh, and he said he's fantastic in the dressing room. You know, he's somebody who could do a job for you. I think probably because he doesn't get riled very easily. And I don't mean that in a will he fight back sense, because obviously he gets riled really easily in that sense. But, you know, in big pressure situations, he doesn't react to pressure. He He sort of goes with it. You know, he could win the Euro lottery this Friday night... 180 million quid, and he'd shrug his shoulders. You know, he wouldn't be running around his living room table, jumping up and down on the chairs like most people. He'd sort of shrug his shoulders and go, doesn't really affect my life that much. I like riding my bike. And that's the sort of person he is. He's probably the most pragmatic person I think I've ever met in my life. It's funny, the cat, because the, uh, normally you'd say one of the four, home, four countries, the captain who had been captain of the... Uh, 
their country would automatically be kept in the lines. But um, we didn't think like that. And it came about uh, because we uh, recognised that we... Well, you had people like Yian Evans, great player, great lion, uh, been captain of Wales, uh, would have been quite an obvious choice. Uh, but we felt in South Africa it wasn't the right thing to have a winger as the captain. We wanted somebody in the heart of the battle where, you know, South Africa, you've got to win the physical battle before you even go anywhere, talking about uh, what kind of rugby you're going to play. Unless you match them there, they're just going to walk all over you. So we felt it was important we had somebody in the heat of the uh, uh, the battle area in the forwards as the captain. I think his good skill was that he wasn't that sort of captain that was overly vocal. He said what needed to be said when it needed to be said. And he had lots of senior voices there that would do most of the talking. Lawrence, a lot of talking. Rod, another leader. Uh, you know, Scott Quinnell, another leader. Jace, uh, Woody, obviously, quite a lot of talking. And then he had people with no power who also liked talking, like me and John Bentley. He was an amazing captain, but he, he, he was a captain that didn't particularly say a lot, you know, but he was surrounded by people who did say a lot. You know, your Alan, Alan Tate, your Keith Woods, your Delilah, your Gus Gotts, you know, different players on different occasions, but John always had the final word. And importantly, everybody always listened. But if, if you watch the games over and over, John O's leadership qualities were about how he played. You know, you'd follow him anywhere. You know, he was just immense, amazing. And then I thought, who knows Martin Johnson better than anybody else in the world? And I thought, the only person that can be is his mum. So I phoned his mum up and asked her, I said, right, uh, well, talk to me about Martin. What do you think of, uh, what are his best traits? She said, well, one thing about Martin is that he'll only ever tell you the truth. And from that moment on, I thought, well... You know, this guy uh, has got to be our captain. He's uh, And Ian and uh, Jim were on board with it, so that's how he got appointed as captain. Although he does get angry when he can't water ski. OK, expand. <laughs> oh, following the 2001 tour, we went on holiday together again. Uh, pr mainly, when people say, why do you go on holiday with Martin Johnson? Why are you two good friends? Good, and I, I sort of tell them, I'm really good at starting fights and he's really good at finishing them. So he's the perfect mate to take on holidays on the beach because the last thing is you want, want to get filled in by some German holiday maker. Um, but he's perfect for that. So uh, we went to see our friend Dave Lockheed in Canada and uh, he's got a boat on a lake and I'd done a lot of water skiing. My dad was a very good water skier. And uh, I was trying to teach him how to ski. And bearing in mind, his neck was completely shattered from the tour, but he wouldn't give up. And he was really getting on my nerves. So I said to Lou, I was driving the boat. I said to Lou, tell me when he's... I said to him, right, we're going to sit you on the dock. We'll dock start you. Take a couple of coils. When I say go, chuck the coils and then just hold on. Don't let go and it'll pull you straight up. Bearing in mind, he's like 19 stone and we're trying to pull him out on a little speedboat. So anyway, Lou said, right, he's not looking. So I just floored the boat and it pulled him straight out the front of his skis and he wouldn't let go for ages. And all you saw was this thin veil of water going over the top of his head with his one eyebrow, which looked like he picked up an otter as he was getting pulled through the water. And then eventually he let go of the handle. It snapped and came shot through in front of the boat. I stopped the engine. He said, come and get me. I was like, are you angry? He said, yeah, I'm really angry. I was like, you can fucking swim back then. Uh, so, yeah, I, I stayed away from him for a couple of hours once he got back to the dock. Well, everybody asked me uh, about behaviour on the tour and I said, well, I only found out what was really going on when I read all the autobiographies sometime later. You can tell quite quickly, I think, with the group of people, the way they behave, the way they mix, whether or not this was going to be an easy group of people to manage and be part of. Really, by the time we left Weybridge, we recognised we had a special group of players there. They mixed well together, there were no cleats, didn't allow that. We knew when we went out, we were a team. The Lions of 97 taught us so much. If you're in a team, whether sporting or business, let us know if you employ any of the techniques we've heard about in this episode. We'd love to hear from you at Inside Tour Pod. I didn't think there was much chance of us being successful. 
But when I got onto that plane on the Saturday, I knew we were going to be successful. It was still a tall order. It was still a big ask. But I knew that during that week, we'd put ourselves in a position that we were in with a shout. So with the Lions laws set, team building complete, and the pub exhausted of supplies, it's time to hit the training pitch in episode three. Scrummaging is something entirely different. You were sucking diesel for the whole thing. You were looking for oxygen wherever you could. This is where the strategy will be set. The master plan to destabilise the Springboks must be honed on a muddy field in southwest London. It was like a clash of stags. That's what it was like. That's episode three of Inside the Tour, which is a 9419 production for Audi. Alex Corbusera here, former British and Irish Lions rugby player and proud ASM Scholarships ambassador, telling you all to check out ASM Scholarships. At ASM, we connect rugby athletes with universities in America that provide sports scholarships. Apply today at asmscholarships.com for your free assessment to see what universities you qualify to.